of Redwood Center for Theoretical, Theoretical Neuroscience. Uh, he received his PhD in Computational and Neural Systems from the California Institute of Technology. Uh, he's taught at UC Davis and is currently a professor of neuroscience at um, currently a professor of neuroscience and optometry at UC Berkeley. Um, so please welcome Bruno. So there's basically three different ways that the field tries to make progress here and, and understand what's going on inside the brain. And so what is the, fir the first is uh, by studying the brain directly. So basically opening up the brain, looking at the parts inside, how these neurons are connected, trying to record the activities of these neurons in response to various stimuli or during certain kinds of behaviors. Okay, so this is basically the field of neurophysiology and neuroanatomy. And I'll try to sort of touch on all, th all three of these. Uh, and then, and I'm sorry, the next is also is then uh, is really a very old discipline which has been going on at least for the last century, and that is without ever opening up the brain, without ever looking at the stuff inside of it, just observing it from the outside and looking at how people or animals behave, uh, how we, and, and what kinds of judgments you make about stimuli, you can make very powerful inferences about the mechanisms that must be inside the box without ever even opening it up. And this is the field of psychophysics and which has told us a lot about the neural mechanisms inside, and predicted these mechanisms long before they were discovered uh, physiologically. And the third area, this is the area that I've been working in, uh, which is more theoretical, so that is, given, given everything that we know about the structure and the anatomy of the brain, about the behavior, let's try to extrapolate and imagine what, what might be going on, what might the computations be going on in this system and to try to flesh out these ideas in a detailed computational model that we can then make predictions from and compare to experiments. Okay, so this is, these are basically the three main branches, I think, that, that the field is pursuing. And uh, so just to kind of give you a gist, in, kind of, in the spirit of what Jennifer Dion did, is it's kind of going from the galaxy down to nanom nanometers. Uh, so I just I'll want to take a guided tour of the brain, going from the sort of macroscopic scale of the structure, of, you know, the stuff, stuff that you see in the brain, uh, down to the um, down to the nanometer scale. So, uh, so this is kind of what you would see if you took a cross section of the brain. This happens to be a, a, a macaque monkey 
macaque monkey cerebral cortex, but you see something very similar if you took a cross section of your brain. And this sort of purple section, this kind of wandering around here, is, this, is the cortex. And it's only about two millimeters thick. Topologically, it's basically a two dimensional sheet of neurons. And for a macaque monkey, that's about the size of a large cookie. And for a human, that's like the size of kind of a, a pizza, a large pizza, maybe, or something like that. Okay, so that's basically your cerebral cortex, is this two dimensional sheet of neurons. And that sheet of neurons is kind of wrapped up, sort of crumpled together, and so it can fit inside your head, right? And so that's what you're looking at when you take a cross section, you're looking at the sheet of neurons just kind of curving around like a crumpled piece of paper, okay? And the white stuff in between the purple stripes is white matter, okay? So it's basically just wires, okay? It's just, just wire bundles that are connecting neurons uh, in the gray matter. It's called gray matter, uh, but it's, it's purple here because it's an initial stain, but if you just didn't make any stain, it would look sort of grayish, maybe. So that's at that's the scale of you know, just looking at the cortex. And now if we just take a, a, a zoom in on a particular section there, um, this is what we would see from initial state, which basically still cells in cell bodies. So each of these dots here, these little blobs, is an individual, individual neuron. And in a square millimeter cortex, there are about 100,000 neurons. So if you just, here's you know, one millimeter on a side, so if you're looking down on this sheet, if you just look down on this sheet and take a, a section that's one millimeter square, you would be able to count about 100,000 neurons in there. And so just to give you a feel for what that means, because we talk about these numbers in neuroscience all the time, you know, uh, and, you know what does it mean to have 100,000 uh, neurons in a square millimeter? Well, this is what you want to try to imagine. This is, this is basically what 100,000 looks like. This is how many people would fit in the Rose Bowl uh, you know, at full capacity. Okay, so imagine this many neurons all squeezed into um, a square, just a square millimeter of cortex, which is you know, just like the letters on a, on a penny or something like that. Okay? And what's more, what's this is sort of frighteningly complicated is that all these people here are like talking to each other. They have fibers connecting them together, and uh, any one person here is connected to a thousand other people or ten thousand other people in, this, in the stadium, and they're all sort of sending messages back and forth to each other within this little square millimeter of tissue, and even beyond the square millimeter, even beyond the millimeter scale. Okay, so that's the challenge we're up against if you want to sort of understand the system. Is at this scale, this you know, this this, this is sort of all over, all over your cerebral cortex. Every, every square millimeter has about this many neurons. And so now, if we take one of these people out of the crowd, what each one of these people is a neuron. Okay, what does that neuron look like? Okay, this is the structure of a neuron. This sort of blob in the center is the, is the soma, the cell body, and these processes extending from it are the dendrites. And those are basically the input processes to the neurons. And basically, there's in, uh, axons from other neurons impinging upon these dendrites. For any given pyramidal cell, it's getting input from the outer order of about 1,000 to 10,000 other uh, neurons in, within, within a little chunk of, of neural tissue. So if we further zoom in on this neuron on one of these on one of the on one of these uh, dendritic uh, one of the dendritic branches, uh, if we looked at it at the scale of an electron microscope, this is what you would see: the cross sections of all these processes of neurons. Okay, so you're just looking at all these axons and dendrites and synapses and so forth. Uh, all intermingling together. And those cartoon diagrams of the brain, they always show like a neuron, and like here, and another neuron there, and there's like a vacuum of space in between them, right? And there's no, there's no air in the brain, right? It's just like all these neurons just crammed right next to each other. And, and, and that's what you see if you take a cross-section in an electron microscope. And, and, and so what you can see then in these electron microscopes is basically a synapse. So where, where two of those, pro, two of those um, cells are, are, are meeting, you can actually see the synaptic vesicles there. That's the sign that there's a synapse there. And if you zoomed on that, what you would see, this is the structure of a synapse. This is how one neuron relays its information to another in the brain is through a synapse. And the, the, the most common type of synapse is a electrochemical synapse. The top portion is the presynaptic junction. And when the top portion depolarizes, goes to more positive voltage, then those little sort of like spheres inside uh, migrate to the membrane and release their contents, which is some kind of neurotransmitter typically glutamate, it's an excitatory neurotransmitter. And that neurotransmitter is then picked up by, or sensed by, the postsynaptic neuron, which is on the bottom. And, and then there's re receptor molecules uh, react to that in various ways by either opening and emitting certain ions or second messenger channels which actually change the chemistry inside the neuron and do all kinds of funky, interesting things. And in fact, there's a whole computational world that occurs just within a single neuron. So if you just sort of omit the whole neural circuit, you could actually study a single neuron as a computational device. And this is still very poorly understood in terms of what, like, what's the computational capacity of even a single neuron. Okay, it's very, very rich in terms of the molecular signal me mechanisms um, that are existing there. Okay, so that's kind of a guided tour of, of the system and the scale, what we're up against if we want to try to understand uh, what's going on. One of the most common methods that people have used up to now 
uh, is what's called single unit recordings. This is really sort of the bread and butter of the, of the neurophysiolo neurophysiology industry for about 50 years or so. We take a single tungsten electrode, just like a wire, and literally stick that wire into the brain. And you're trying to bring the tip of that wire near a single neuron. And when it gets close enough, then when that neuron fires an axon potential, when it depolarizes, when it changes its voltage, then you can actually sense that change in voltage from the outside of the neuron. It changes the electric field in the surrounding area enough that you can sense that change in the electric field and measure the activity of that neuron. You can see it spiking. Okay? So you can put your electrode up to some neuron. Of course, you can't see it as you're doing this. You just sort of blindly stick in the brain, kind of get, hearing these spikes coming out of the loudspeaker, and now you're going to look at the response of that neuron uh, to some kind of stimulus or while the animal performs some task and try to do something about what that neuron is doing, what, what's the sort of role of that neuron in perception or motor function or cognition. And this has sort of been the bread and butter, butter of the industry. But as you can imagine, you know, this is going to be very slow progress, right? You know, recording from one neuron at a time, a system that has 10 billion neurons. Uh, it's just kind of like, you know, why are we even bothering doing this? You know? but, but, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of ironically, we, we, we've learned a lot this way, right? And, um, and you might not imagine we would, but we've made a lot of intuitions and insights about how the system is working just at this scale. But of course, if you really want to understand things, you have to, look at, you have to be able to look at large numbers of neurons uh, simultaneously. And so there's been uh, now a whole array of different techniques coming out that allow this to happen and all at different scales. Uh, so one is uh, sort of, a sort of macro, uh, macroscopic scale, what's called ECOG, that's up at the upper left, where uh, in certain patients that have to go undergo surgery to the brain, typically in, in epilepsy, sometimes they have, people are having severe uh, seizures that just limit their ability to, to function at all, you have to remove some part of the tissue. And in order to know what part of the tissue to remove, you have to be able to record uh, from a large population of the brain, a large swath of the brain, for a period of time. So this technique has been now commonly used in many labs, in many hospitals across, across the country. And here at UCSF, Eddie Chang is one of the people who's, um, who's do, doing this a lot. And so these electrodes, basically they're electrodes, it's kind of a sheet, a plastic sheet of these electrodes that's planted over the cortex. And now you can let a person do, you know, walk around and talk and stuff, and sort of figure, look at what's going on in the brain. This is for clinical purposes, but at the same time, if the subject is willing, you can do scientific experiments on them and basically gain a lot of information about what's, what's going on. So this is the ECOG. So you're not looking at individual neurons, but you're looking at basically the activity across a, a sort of at the macroscopic scale. The silicon polytrose in the upper right is basically a, it's what's called a silicon pro. It's a shaft of silicon with about on the order of maybe 50 to 300 or so electrodes along the length of the, along the length of the electrode. You can stick that thing into the cortex and record from many neurons simultaneously up to maybe 100 or you know, 200 neurons simultaneously um, across different layers of the cortex. And the one that people are really excited about now um, is this what's called optical imaging shown at the bottom. And the idea in optical Im imaging is that you put a dye on the cortex that uh, makes the calcium inside the neurons uh, fluoresce. Okay, so these basically these neurons kind of light up like Christmas tree lights when you look at a, a cross section of neural tissue. And so now you can actually look at you know just you know hundreds, if not maybe you know even thousands of neurons um, activating simultaneously. Um, Right. This is just an example of the kind of pictures you get, different cross sections. Okay? And, the, and the, the white spots are basically neurons that are active, and where there's not a white spot, that means there's a neuron that is not active. Okay? And so, so that's the idea of the two-photon calcium imaging. So it's really allowing us to view the activity of the brain at unprecedented scales uh, and resolution in and, and, and both space and time. Um, it's just not, it not been possible before. So a lot of people are very excited about this, about this technique. And so what goes kind of hand-in-hand hand with that is this field of connectomics. So I showed you this, this uh, picture before, the cross-section, this electron microscope cross-section of the cortex, where you can see all these processes intertwined. And the sort of holy grail of neuroscience has for a long time has been able to reconstruct an entire neural circuit. So what people have been able to do with these electron microscope cross-sections for quite a while is to trace an individual neuron. Okay, so that they basically painstakingly take all these sections in, in serial form and take one single neuron fill it with a dye, and then from those cross-sections try to reconstruct what that single neuron looks like. But you're just reconstructing one neuron in the whole population. Okay, so what we want to try to do now is reconstruct all the neurons there and try to deduce how they're connected. And this is what's been now called the field of connectomics, which you may have heard of, uh, and is you know, brightly guided by machine learning algorithms, the ability uh, to, to automate this process so you can look at a cross-section, automatically segment, segment where those different neurons are in the, in the, in the tissue, and piece together those, those uh, segmentations 
and reconstruct a, a, a neural circuit here. So this is starting to be successfully done in, uh, in, in certain systems like the retina, where we've actually learned a lot from, from doing that. And so a lot of people hope that we're going to be able to do this um, in many more systems to come. And, and so, of course, you know, to sort of put it together what I just told you the, 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 uh, about the calcium imaging, the potential exists now to take a block of, uh, of neural tissue with calcium imaging, record from the neurons in that tissue, and then in that same tissue, uh, basically cross take cross, cross sections of it um, and, uh, and, 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 re and reconstruct the neural circuit that gave rise to that activity. Okay? So that's kind of like the, the dream of many neuroscience labs around the country would be able to do that. And I think we're going to be able to learn a, learn a lot by putting those two, putting those two uh, things together. Okay, so but, but before going further, I just kind of want to mention, you know, a lot of what I've been showing you here is pictures of the mammalian uh, cortex. And so there's a big emphasis sort of on understanding human brains and how humans work and, you know, uh, how are we going to understand how the human brain works and so forth. Which is obviously, we, we care a lot for, uh, we care a lot about it for, um, for, for, for disease and so forth. But the point I want to make with this slide is that if you're interested in the neural basis of intelligence, or the neural basis of perception, then a human isn't necessarily the best place to start. Because there are many animals throughout, throughout the animal kingdom that have really amazing perceptual abilities. They, they seem to see as well as a cat or other, other animals, and they just have incredible feats of, of, of perception. That, um, and I think we can learn a lot from, from studying these simpler animals. So for example, the jumping spider has eight eyes. It uses these two big lens eyes on the front of its head to, to they have, which have very high resolution, but it's sort of tunnel vision to do pattern recognition. And they can just basically distinguish prey from potential mates um, using their visual system. And they also do very complex three-dimensional navigation with their visual system. They have a sort of 360 degree view of the visual field. The sand wasp has a compound eye and uh, uses this compound eye to also perform navigation over very long distances. So the sand wasp builds its nest in the sand, as a hole in the sand, and it hunts as far as a mile away from its nest for typically honeybees, and when it finds the bee or some prey item, then it finds its way back to its nest, you know, a mile uh, away, uh, which is this, again this little hole in the sand, right? So somehow the ability they have the ability to memorize waypoints along the way and, and navigate over these very long distances uh, with with their visual system and, and a brain with on the order of about a billion neurons. Okay, and then what's even more amazing here is the box jellyfish, because the box jellyfish doesn't even have a brain. Right? It's, it's like all jellyfish, but the box jellyfish has these amazing eyes. Uh, these, these eyes in the box jellyfish have nearly perfect optics. And it's thought what they're, that what they're doing with these eyes is uh, basically surveying the terrestrial landscape. So basically looking above the water surface to judge where they are in the river. So because these, these box jellyfish, they, they find their prey typically along the river banks. So they kind of want to know where they are. They don't want just pieces hanging out in the middle of the river. They kind of want to be under the tree canopy on the side. Okay, so, so they have these really amazing visual systems. They have a total of 24 eyes that they survey the, the world with. Okay, so I think there's a lot we can learn just by studying these simple organisms, doing conectomics and two-photon calcium imaging and so forth um, on, these, on these animals as well. So we shouldn't be just like myopically focused on, on human brains. So I want to I speak to a little bit about you know, what are the implications for technology uh, in this and also you know, for, for maybe art and, and aspects of perception. The first about technology, this touches to, on what Peter Norvig uh, talked, about, um, talk, talked about earlier. So there's a big push now um, and, and, and you know, great need, I think, in industry to be able to recognize images, right? There's you know, bazillions of images that exist in, on these databases, and companies want to know what's in these images, right? And uh, typically, a lot of times, these images don't come with tags, right? It's just sort of an image sitting there, and you'd like to know what's in it. And this, is a very hard, this has been a very hard problem for computers to solve, and this is just meant to kind of illustrate why. Uh, what, what's being shown here is this, this pattern here is basically the intensity um, as a function of space. What an image is is basically just intensity at a, uh, as a function of two dimensions, right, in your retina. Okay, the, the, back, the back of your eye, you just have this image plane. And uh, what's, showing being, what's being shown here is two, di two different images, but in a format you're just not used to seeing, right? Usually you look at an image with your eye and you can perceive it and understand what's in it. But this is the actual data that your brain is interpreting. Okay, so this is showing the image as an elevation plot, where the height at each point in that surface is the intensity, and the position is then the two-dimensional position uh, within the eye. Okay? So believe it or not, these two functions here that you're looking at are images of the exact same scene, just from slightly different viewpoints. So can anyone guess what these, what these functions are an image of? 
what the seed is. Wild guess, <laughs> right? So this is the problem that your brain has to solve, right? Is given this function, given this intensity profile, what am I looking at? What's out there in the world? That's what the rest of the brain wants to know. Okay, so this is what their images are. Okay, so now with you know, so after the fact, you can kind of look back and you can see the you know evidence for the bicycle wheel, the rim of the wheel, in both of those functions. But it did you know it didn't occur to you obviously at first, just looking at those functions, right? So somehow the brain has to take all this data and kind of piece it together and sort of back out a model for what's going on in the world. And it's just, you know, it's obvious, it's a very non, non obvious process how you do this. This is what people in computer science and computer vision have struggled with for decades, is how to make a computer solve this problem. And we, you can see here one reason why you kind of get, why it's very challenging, because you can see these very, very, these very big fluctuations in activity in that surface that are due simply to lighting in the background. So that picture in the upper right, you can see the sun shining through on the lawn in the back, right? And that's creating a big fluctuation in intensity, right? So normally to a single processing system or computer, if you see this big fluctuation, you sort of think, well, gosh, that must be really important. Let me focus all the you know, attention there. Well, that's not important. We, just, we don't even bother looking at that, right? It's just immediately sort of filtered out. And that's the background, that's the sunshine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can sort of just extract the shape of the bicycle in front here. Okay? So, so how, what, what do we know about how this is solved in, in the visual system? So what we what we know is that it's not all it's not solved in one in one shot, right? It's not like one box in the system that just sort of solves it. It's solved progressively in a series of different areas. So this is just showing a picture of the macaque macaque monkey cortex from the side. And this is an animal that study a lot for understanding uh, the visual cortex. And those colored regions, those colored regions are all the areas involved in vision. And for the macaque monkey, those comprise about 50 percent of the of the surface area of the of the entire cerebral cortex. And for humans, it's only about 20, 20 to 25 percent or so. Okay, so what we what it's been learned about these areas is you know the, how they're sort of parcelated, but also how they're connected together. So what's shown below is a wiring diagram of how all those different boxes. So from a cat monkey, there's about 30 different modules within the visual cortex. And so there's a lot been learned from neuroanatomy about how those all those boxes connect together. And what emerges from that, those studies, is a clear hierarchical organization where the image data first comes into this area V1 on the left from the retina and is processed in that area. And that area does some kind of computation and chunking on the information and sends its result to a next visual area in this, this box V2. That V box V2 does kind of, some kind of computation on the data and sends its data, sends its result to another box higher up in the, in, in the stream. So the information kind of percolates up this, this pathway. And if you record from neurons in this very low area in V1, you find that those neurons are very highly related to image properties. They have very small receptive fears. They're just kind of responding to local image features, edges, and so forth, local edges in, in, the, in the image. Where these neurons at higher level, if you record from those boxes like CIT, AIT, those green boxes to the right, then you find neurons that are selected to entire objects, like a face. So if you show a face, then that makes the neuron fire like crazy. If you show anything else, the neuron won't fire. And the neuron, moreover, is not sensitive to the exact details of the position of the face. You can move around the face the position, you can change the size, and the neuron continues to respond. So it's sort of encoding something more abstract, a more abstract property of the scene. Properties of the face, not the image per se. Okay? And of course, in then between, you sort of see progressive, uh, that sort of transformation happening progressively in, 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 in several stages. And so it turns out this, this architecture has been very inspirational to people in machine learning that have now devised neural network models that have basically been inspired by, by this idea of hierarchical organization. And so the idea is, is this is what uh, like Peter Norbach talked about earlier, is they've designed these neural networks that are sort of divided into different layers. We start with the image on the left. So the image, uh, oh, sorry. So the image uh, is fed in on the left, and is fed through all these different layers that are hierarchical organized, and the achievement varies by pooling. Basically, at each stage, you have some amount of feature selection that occurs, and then a pooling where you basically sum over, sum over the responses of uh, neurons in a, in a local region so that you're less sensitive to the exact details of where they are in the image. And what they've shown is that when you look at the, they can, you can train this system end to end so that these neurons on the right, and that box on the right, are sensitive, are selective to um, particular object categories and images. And this is showing it. A particular example, and you know, these results are really stunning. I think for, for everybody in the field, there's a sort of transformation that occurred over maybe four years ago or so. 
uh, and people really struggled with these problems for a long time and never been able to achieve anything like this kind of performance. Where you can take images, this is, these are images that, that the system has never seen before. Okay? It's been trained in a whole database of other images. So you're taking images that it's never seen before and it's you know, classifying them here as a Dalmatian dog, as a squirrel monkey. As Peter showed, it's not perfect, you know, it makes mistakes, um, obviously, but, but the degree of success here is just stunning. And so the field has kind of really undergone a transformation and, uh, and, and moving towards these kind of more neural, uh, neural approaches, which are actually, what's interesting is that they're inspired by this, this, neural, this neural architecture of the brain. And I think there's an interesting uh, thing going on here also that's relevant to the electronics industry, right? Because uh, the electronics industry is currently up against uh, this thing we call Moore's Law, the end of Moore's Law, right? And uh, where we can't, we can't make these circuit elements any smaller or faster or lower power without incurring a, a higher degree, much higher degree of stochasticity. So what's interesting is these elements that we have in computers, these transistors, they've always been stochastic all along. It's just that we've been working at voltage levels that are so well separated that we never have to deal with that inherent stochasticity, stochasticity that's, that's there. But as you bring those voltage levels closer together, and as you make the system faster, and, uh, and, and so forth, then, uh, then, then you basically have to deal with the, the, these, 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 these stochastic errors there. So you, sometimes you may write a one into the memory, and you know, it just flips and you get a zero back out. Right? So what do you do about that? Well, currently in all disk drives and many um, data storage and transmission devices, there is built-in forms of error correction. But those error correction uh, algorithms are typically meant to deal with a really, really low error rates. If you start to turn up the error rate to like one in a hundred or something like that, then you know it's like people don't really have a good way of dealing with that. We're not really a sort of a custom field, it's not a custom deal with dealing with things that have very high error rates. But what's interesting about these neural network algorithms is that they love noise. When you train the system, when you in order to train the system, you have to actually inject tons of noise into the system. You have to add noise to make it work. To do that. Okay? So these systems very, work very naturally with stochastic elements. So I think there's a big opportunity here to, in the next generation of electronic devices, to exploit, explo exploit these more neurally inspired algorithms which have been shown to be very useful for image recognition and speech recognition tasks and language understanding tasks and so forth. Uh, and, and be able to exploit these new uh, low power and faster um, and stochastic, stochastic neural architectures, which are also inherently analog. All the computation of the system is analog. Okay? There's no need for digital computation. <coughs> so I think that, that there can be an interesting kind of confluence, um, an interesting confluence of, of neuroscience and, and technology happening here, where, um, where, where I think the, the two fields are going to actually learn a lot from each other. I think that we in neuroscience have a lot to learn as people advance these machine learning algorithms and get them to work better, we have a lot to learn about what these internal representations of the brain uh, might be. So the last point that I want to um, touch on is the uh, potential implications uh, for, um, for art. And this is uh, totally speculative, so bear with me for a bit. Uh, but I just want to sort of tell you about so a few, few insights you know from psychophysics and from neuroscience that, that might uh, give us more sort of understanding of how we see the world and basically ways that we can, we can manipulate perception and the way people see things that might be relevant for, for how, we, how we do art. Uh, so, so let's start with color vision. And so, so color vision, we've learned a lot from color vision uh, by, by studies of what's called adaptation, where you adapt the visual system to one color, and then when you show white, it looks like something else. It looks, it looks like it's colored as a result of this adaptation. And we know basically now the, the neural basis of this adaptation. Okay, it's due to basically different types of neurons that are selected to different directions in color space. So what we're showing in this diagram here is the CIE di diagram of the color space with white in the middle and all the di different colors going around. And the circumference, as you move away from the center of the out to the rim, then you're going from, uh, from white to a more uh, saturated, uh, saturated color. Okay? And so what we know is that in the LGN, in the thalamus, the, the part of the brain that relays information to the cortex, there's two types of neurons. There's basically two special directions in this space. One tuned to this axis, which is called L and M constant. L and M stands for long and medium. So the cones, the three cone types you have in your eye are long, medium, and short wavelength uh, sensitive uh, cones. And that's basically the basis of your color vision. So, so one, one class of neurons, is sensitive to this direction. So if you, if you perturb the colors 
on, along this axis, the L in a constant direction, this, this class of neurons is firing like crazy, but the other sets of neurons are completely silent. They don't see that at all. Okay? And vice versa, if you perturb the color along this other direction called S constant, then those neurons are firing like crazy, and these other neurons are not firing at all. Okay? So you basically have two neurons, two classes of neurons, tuned to these two different directions, and none in between. So it's basically a bimodal distribution, it's a cluster distribution of neurons. Okay? So that's basically the way that nature designed us. Okay? And, uh, and so now, uh, so basically, what, what now given that information, you can predict how people are going to see something um, after you adapt them to a certain sort of stimulus. Okay? So let's say I move you away from white. I initially show you away, uh, white, but I move you away from white, so I'm showing you yellow. So you the far part of that axis to the upper right, I'm showing you yellow. And what happens now is that you're, you're basically pounding these neurons a lot. So these neurons are firing like crazy. And when neurons fire like crazy for a while, they, they kind of get tired, okay? Um, almost literally, right? They just they start to fire, and, you know, they just kind of, okay, yeah, you yell, what am I supposed to do, right? And they just kind of die off in response, okay? And so that's called a kind of habituation of the neuron. And that can be a fairly long-lasting thing. It lasts for about under order of seconds, okay? And uh, so now what that means is that once I've sort of set, I hit you with that yellow now, when I go back to white, normally these two classes of neurons, there's neurons on the left that are sensitive to the blue, and neurons on the right sensitive to the yellow, right? Normally when I show you white, you have an equal balance of blue and yellow. So when the blue and yellow neurons are firing equally, that means white is out there in the world, when I see equal amounts of activity. Okay, but now when I show you white, the yellow neurons are tired. They're not firing as much the blue neurons are still firing quite a bit, right? And so the brain sees this imbalance, and it says, oh, that must be blue. Even though it's physically there, is white. Okay, so I'll just show you an example. I'm sure you guys have all seen this before, this, these famous color adaptation example, uh, demos. But what you want to do here is fixate, fixate this cross in the center. Just hold your eyes on the cross. As you hold this eyes on the cross, and these, these different colored panels are exciting different parts of your retina, right? And in turn, different parts of your brain. Okay, and the neurons in the, upper, in the upper left, that are sensitive to red, they're firing like crazy, they're kind of getting tired. Hold your eyes on the cross, right? So keep your eyes on the cross. And, uh, and so now we're going to switch you back to white. And uh, when you go back to white, those <laughs> panels look like they're colored briefly, right? Okay, and the exact opposite. Let's do that again just so you can kind of see it. Okay? So the reason why you're seeing those colors is because we changed your brain. Right? By staring at this, you are physically altering the neurons in your brain. Okay? You're changing basically the hardware there. You're turning down the gains on those neurons. Uh, and uh, temporarily, you're experiencing now color uh, where there is none. Uh, there's a really kind of astonishing example of this. Uh, the website that has this demo down here. Uh, so what, you know, this is a, just a picture, a grayscale image of a castle. This started out as a color image, a color image of a castle. And, but we just separated out the color information from the grayscale information. So we're just showing you the grayscale portion of this castle image. And now what you're going to look at here is the colors of that castle image, except they've been reversed. So what we're showing you is just the chromatic content of that image, but the exact opposite of it. And what you're going to do is fixate that black dot. Just hold your eyes on that black dot in the middle. And as you hold your eyes on that black dot, you're adapting your brain to these colors right here. Right? So when I go back to white or gray, uh, then you're going to see the opposite color. And the opposite color is going to be correct. These would not be the correct colors for that scene. Right? As you can say, because the sky is yellow, right? I mean, orange, right? The sky should not be orange. Uh, and so, so just hold your eyes on that black dot, and then we're going to flip back to the uh, gray image, and just hold your eyes in the same place on that image. Whoa! Okay? So it's a way to uh, briefly colorize an image. Right? So this is just what's stuff going on in your brain. So scientifically, we understand entirely what's going on, right? We can explain this phenomenon. We can exactly predict how you're going to perceive the world in terms of color based on the kinds of neurons in your brain. So we have a very good understanding, a very solid understanding of this in terms of the, the neural mechanisms inside your brain. Okay? But now what's really astonishing is people have taken this phenomenon of color adaptation they basically taken this phenomenon of color adaptation and sort of moved it into a different realm of shape perception. Right? This is not a place where it was obvious to people that you would have a similar kinds of phenomenon. But what, uh, this is work done by Mike Webster at the University of Nevada, Reno. And
And what, they, what they're showing here is basically a, a faces along a continuum. So think of this as the analogy of colors, where white is like in the middle, and then blue or something like that is the left, and you know, yellow on the right. Uh, so, so here we have a more from the top row from and gender. So from uh, from male on the left to female on the right, and the, the, the middle is, would be sort of a morph that's in between. That's kind of an androgynous, maybe looking face. Uh, and ethnicity uh, going from what looks like Caucasian to Asian on the right, and then expression from disgust to surprise, and a morph in between. So what they've shown is that you can basically do a very similar uh, experiment here to the color adaptation we just showed you, right? So if you, normally if you just looked at a face in the middle here, if I just showed you one of those middle faces, you would say, if I asked you was a male or female for the top one, uh, then you would probably just be like 50-50, you know? It's just like, you wouldn't know really how to answer, right? It's just right, right down the middle. People sort of give 50-50 responses to that face in the middle on the top row. Okay, but now, if I adapt you to the face on the left, that's like adapting you to, you know, red or something, right? If I adapt you to the face on the right, I'm just gonna make you stare at that face for like 15 seconds, okay? You're changing the neurons in your brain. These aren't color neurons, though. These are neurons way high up in your cortex that are selective to shape features and faces and so forth, right? And they live in some kind of shape space. Scientifically, we don't know the axes of that shape space, but still, they exist, right? Uh, and so, as you stare at that male face, then when you look back to the face in the middle, the neutral face, it now looks more female. So people will reliably judge it to be female, even though just before the adaptation they would say they would be 50-50. And same with all these, all, all these other examples here. So and, and you could extend it to other kinds of expression if you adapt. If you adapt to a sad face, then uh, a neutral face looks happy, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So this works along many different dimensions of uh, facial expression. Okay, so, and, uh, so now this is something, you know, this sort of hints at the existence of these, of, of these axes and as sort of a higher, a higher level of the brain. And I'll just um, show you one example here of this face adaptation, the consequences of this face adaptation, because what this means is really striking. It means that how you perceive the world, right? How you perceive a face, how you perceive a face basically depends on the face that you saw before it, right? I mean, we sort of think of ourselves as objective observers. Like, I know what that is because I'm looking at it, right? But no, I mean, how, you, how it appears to you depends on how you've adapted. Right, how, how the neurons in your, in, in your brain have adapted. Okay, so there's a really astonishing demo of this, where um, they, uh, let's see, let me make this, okay. Uh, so what you're gonna do here is just fixate this cross in the center, and there's spaces being shown on the side of celebrities, which, you know, you all know, uh, and they don't been altered at all, okay? But they're gonna start to look very strange to you. So if you just fixate the center right now, that Tom Cruise probably still looks like Tom Cruise on the left. If you just hold your eyes in the middle, I don't know who the actress is. Maybe <laughs> something deal. So, so, uh, so the um, so, so if you just hold. What you're going to do is just hold your eyes on that cross in the middle. And uh, now what you're going to see is a series of faces played one after the other. Uh, and you're going to notice something very interesting. Just hold your hold your eyes in the middle. distortion of your perceptual space. The way these faces appear uh, is, is being profoundly distorted. And, it's, and one thought, one theory is that it's because of the space adaptation phenomenon I, I just showed you before. So we know a similar thing would happen in color vision. If I show you a series of colors like that, then you know, if I showed you yellow you know, just after being followed by red, well, it would look different depending you know, if, if I showed you it followed by purple or another color. Right? Um, so so but, you know, it wasn't really expected that you would see something similar for um, for faces, but you do, and so so I think that what this is, you know, I, th I think it has really, you know, again, this is very speculative, but I think it has really important implications for uh, you know how artists designing uh, designing you know paintings and shapes of sculpture and so forth, and you know, how we perceive the world. It's not, you know, we don't all perceive the world the same way, uh, and uh, how we how we perceive a certain shape, uh, just how just the same way, you know, the way we perceive a color depends on what we've been adapted to. 
and very strong. And and uh, and I think one exciting prospect is you know whereas for the color for the color dimension we know about a lot about the neurophysiology you know here we know about a lot about the neuroscience about the mechanisms that are happening there. For these space adaptation studies, we really don't know. We really don't have a, a good handle on what those axes are in that space. But all these studies now in the field of deep learning, where we're basically learning these representations, I think there's hope that as we learn these representations that are useful for these tasks, that that might tell us something about what these axes are in the space and, 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 and give us um, uh, important insights that we could use in psychophysics and, and neurophysiology. Okay, so I want to end with one uh, with one other example. I can't end to talk on vision without uh, showing you this uh, you know this stunning dress, which uh, made us waves through the internet um, last spring, and this really captivated the vision science community because I just told you we, we understand a lot about the neural mechanisms of color vision, and it was never sort of anticipated that you would ever see this kind of individual difference between observers because we know that even though. We all have different ratios of L, M, and cones in our L, M, and S cones in our eyes, right? So we have different, slightly different ratios of these cones. Humans all perform exactly the same at color matching tasks. We're identical. As long as you're not colorblind, as long as you're not missing a cone type, we all perform identically, psychophysically, on color matching tasks. Okay. So, uh, so how many we, we look, how many people see this dress as uh, gold and white? I'm just curious. How many people see it as blue? And black. Okay? This is access. How could this be? Right? You're like, what? Right? And, and again, science has no explanation for this. Right? So people have studied all these mechanisms of color vision and, uh, and, uh, and, and those axes I showed you in color space, but you know, just, we, we don't really understand how, how there could be such a profound difference in human observers. But I'll just give you one speculation for how this might come about. This is uh, due to a scientist in uh, Japan, uh, Akitosha. Who, uh, basically, they sort of made a cartoon, kind of a simplified version of this, of this dress. And uh, so, believe it or not, this region in, in the color region, I mean, the, in the, that rectangle, the rectangle, sort of eliminated rectangular region, is identical on the left and on the right. Okay? So, in one case, you sort of see this as a black and blue dress, and on the right, you see this as a white and yellow dress, obviously. And I'll just put you the Japanese, the translation from the Japanese here. Okay, so it's the dress problem, uh, blue-black in a bright place, okay, versus white-gold in a dark place. Okay? And they're basically both exactly the same thing. Okay, both are the same color, and uh, confirm it with an eyedropper tool. So if you had Photoshop, you know, you could sort of take a sample of those colors and verify yourself that they're identical, but we don't have an eyedropper tool. Do something else here, which is to aperture out the different parts of the scene, and all that. They're totally identical. Okay? So, so this maybe gives us some insight to the puzzle here. That, uh, so one explanation, one explanation for what's going on is that people who see it as a black and blue dress are assuming, basically assuming internally in their model of the world, they're assuming a brighter illumination of the scene. Maybe they have some bias in the brain. They just sort of say, yeah, you know, it's probably being brightly illuminated, so that must be that must be a black and blue dress. Whereas the people who see it as red, I mean, I'm sorry, as white and white and gold. Uh, they're just, they have a different bias in the brain, a bias towards darker illumination. They say, well, that's a, you know, sort of, it's in a dark room, and I'm looking at this dress, so it must be actually uh, yellow, uh, yellow and, and white, or gold and white. Okay? Even though, even though the, the, the measurements, the amount of light coming from these two dresses is physically identical. Okay? There's nothing different about the dress, it's only inside your brain that these things are different. So there's some sort of internal bias in your brain that biases people towards one versus the other. But this is your brain, not in your eye. Okay, so it's not due to color blindness or some weird thing like that. It's something inside your brain, uh, deep inside your brain, and uh, that nobody really understands. All right. So, anyways, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. And, um, so, do the people who see the dress as blue and black have better night vision? <laughs> wow, that's great. Um, yeah, so, it's a good, that's, that's, so I don't know about that, I, I have no idea, but, but there's a logical inference, or, you know, you might, if, if it's true that they, um, you know, if you see the, the black, I'm sorry, you said the blue and black, yeah, if they see the blue and black, and so if the, if the explanation is true that you're assuming a brighter luminance, then you should be able to show, transfer this effect to another situation, right, show that in another situation they also are assuming a brighter luminance, this is just something they always do, right? Somebody must have done an experiment by now. I, so I don't know. That would be a great experiment.
satisfied. That's, that'd be the way you want to test, test, test that assumption. All right, so I wonder, the last thing you say was what we see depends on our adaptations to what we saw before, which is really interesting. Like, gets to the point that I, I'm almost wondering if um, the role of the subconscious mind is easily explained by just studying the physiology of our brain, because everything that, that you saw before may as well have been explained as subconscious mind, which have not, probably have not been studied as much in terms of computational modeling and all that. But now that you can put that in just the physics sense, the material impact sense, do you agree to that, or do you think that there's still a role for I mean, subconscious you, you, mind? You were perfectly conscious of what you saw before. Uh, and uh, so maybe, you may not be aware, you know, in the next 10 seconds, you maybe you forgot what you saw, right? So you may not be conscious of it later. Nevertheless, it still influences you at a subconscious level, right? I think that's maybe the way to think about this. But, um, but there are other ways of doing this, these kinds of adaptations uh, subconsciously, right? There's ways of, like, you know, you, you know, probably you've heard of the phenomenon where you can flash images very briefly in a series of movie frames. Uh, and even though uh, observers don't report seeing the image, like you flash popcorn or something like that, right? They don't have any conscious awareness that they saw the popcorn. If you give them another test, like, you know, detecting different objects, they'll respond better than chance on detecting popcorn or with a higher sensitivity. So these are well-known phenomena where you can have these sub sort of subconscious, subconscious priming. That you, you're not aware that you saw this and you behave as though you did in, in another realm. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, so I, you know, I, I think it's uh, the main idea. I think is that, you, you're, you're, that basically this adaptation is changing your brain in a way that you're not overtly aware of. You know, you, you don't, you don't maybe not aware that it changed, but you nevertheless you're going to make these different uh, report report things differently as a result. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but. Uh, so, in regards to the way you were describing that our habituation of certain colors and therefore our um, visually not responding as much to that color. So, in an environment where you have a lot of blue, you stop seeing blue or where you just see the variance. As a photographer, you might say that's a feature. You know? When you're in a blue environment, you're more okay. interested in the differences between different colors. That's right. So, do you think, or you know, is there research available to say? Whether those neurons are getting tired because they're it's they're choosing to, or whether or, or whether it's because that they have to. Yeah. No. It's, it's, thanks for asking the question. It's a perfect question, and I kind of glossed over that. But what you're saying is exactly right. This is a feature. It's not a bug. It's not some fluke of the system, right? It's you're you're doing this adaptation for a reason, and because it's exactly you want. Normally, you want to dis discount the illuminant, right? So if we put this scene under you know blue blue illumination. Initially, everything would look kind of blue and weird to you, right? But if you just sort of sit here for about 15 minutes, then gradually your, your visual system starts to adjust, and you're not aware of it, and you'll, you'll call the, the wall white. Even though initially you called it blue, right? If we illuminate it with blue, the wall will look blue. But after a while, you'll start to call it white, right? Uh, and, you, and you're basically renormalizing. So the way to think about it is if I immerse you sort of in a different milieu of colors, your whole visual system is moving the mean and variance of its you know, neural kind of response space to that color distribution. And so we can see that happening over a short time scale. So Mike Webster has actually been studying this uh, in the wild, so to speak, outside the laboratory, where he's actually uh, gone to a certain village in India where they, uh, the countryside changes dramatically in, in its color milieu from one season to the next. So if you go there in the summer, it's very dry, it's full of oranges and browns and, and stuff like that. And if you go in there in the winter, it's just full of deep green, you know, luscious vegetation. Uh, and so what he's you know, actually sh shown is that you, know, you can measure that color distribution, and human observers show an adaptation, basically, to those, to those different color color uh, between different seasons. Hi. Um, I wondered if you're doing any theoretical modeling that would help explain various kinds of mental illness. Various what? Kinds of mental illness. I am not, but um, you know, and I, uh, quite frankly, I don't know a lot of people who are. Uh, but this is uh, uh, something that I think people are starting to talk about. So one of my colleagues uh, in Israel is a psychiatrist, 
and he's one of the pioneers of a new field they call computational psychiatry, where uh, he, you know, he's as a professional psychiatrist, he will be the first to dis discipline. He says that psychiatry is a completely ad hoc uh, discipline. They kind of just, you know, they don't really have a, really a strong scientific basis for a lot of the diagnoses a lot of the time. And so he really wants to make it a much more quantitative discipline and be able to characterize human behaviors uh, in a more systematic way. And builds, brings, you know, tools of machine learning and so forth to this discipline to sort of give, have more objective um, scoring uh, behaviors and things like that. So um, I think that's something that people are starting to think about, but I, there's not a whole lot of work that I know in that area. Um, so I have a question which is um, related to, there was a study uh, which I heard about on NPR, so I'm not sure if I can give you that much about who did it, but saying that when there's not words for certain colors in a language, those colors basically don't exist, mm. or those colors are then grouped into uh, what we would consider as yes. a different color. Do you find that related to or opposing this mean variance of color based off of past adaptation? Yeah, so this is a uh, this is a highly debated topic, uh, and uh, and so you know whether uh, your color perception is determined by culture versus the color environment that you live in. You know, the way people talk about colors versus you know, the colors that you actually experience statistically in the world. And uh, I think there's uh, there's sort of evidence you can sort of pull up on either side of this debate, but I think there's. I sort of, when my, my personal interpretation of the literature in this era is that it falls strongly in the statistical camp, that it really depends much more on the, um, on the milieu of colors that you're, that you're immersed in. And so one, one piece of evidence is that if you, uh, if you go to different cultures that have very different languages, very different naming schemes for colors, and if you, um, if you ask them to point at um, the colors that are sort of most uh, descriptive to them or whatever, the way they sort of Think about color in the world. If you just give them a sort of color chart, they always have the same clusters in this color chart space, right? So you've, these are languages that have very different naming schemes and you know, ways of talking about um, color, but, but they're sort of they, they behave more universally. And because you know they're all they all basically have the same environment that they're exposed to. You have a blue sky, we have green vegetation, uh, and you know the color of the skin and so forth. And so uh, uh, the, the idea is that it's probably more based on statistics. Bruno, I have a question. <clears throat> if I am going on a blind date, which face should I email my date to make sure that my face yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite, oh, oh, oh. right? You, you, you answer in private. I don't yeah, know. okay. <laughs> right. Right. 